Hi, I'm Hope Dector. I'm the creative director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. I'm happy to be welcoming you to the second workshop in the Building Capacity for Mutual Aid Groups series presented by Dean Speed and co-sponsored by BCRW, Fireweed Collective, and Survived and Punished New York. Tonight's workshop will focus on decision making. More information about all four workshops in the series is available on the event page linked below this video and in the chat. And we hope folks will join us for the additional sessions. We're also working with Dean to create additional resources from this series, including a series of short videos highlighting topics addressed in the workshops. The first of these short videos addressing burnout in mutual aid groups was released yesterday. Sophie will drop a link in the chat now, and we'll also be posting the videos on social media and the workshop event pages. I want to offer a few quick notes on accessibility and gratitude, starting with a land acknowledgement. Tonight's event is taking place online, but we are all physically located someplace, and we recognize that all land is indigenous land. Barnard College is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lenape people. In terms of accessibility, you can find a link to access live transcription for this event directly under the video on the BCRW event page or in the YouTube video description. Thank you to Lydia Perez from Total Caption for providing the live transcription. Our ASL interpreters for tonight's event are Trisha Vasquez and MJ Jones. We're so happy to be working with you again and we're grateful to you for providing this essential service. We are planning for tonight's workshop to take place for one and a half hours, ending around 8.30 Eastern time. If you have a question for Dean, you can type it into the YouTube chat at any time, and we'll be collecting any questions there for the Q&A that will take place towards the end of the workshop. I also want to thank my coworkers at BCRW for making programs like tonight possible, including Elizabeth Castelli, Pam Phillips, Avi Cummings, Miriam Neptune, and especially Sophie Kreitzberg, who is coordinating so much of the work that goes into these events behind the scenes, including managing the social media and communications during the event. And to BCRW student research assistant, Eve Glazier, who is working with Sophie behind the scenes tonight. We're so excited to be partnering with Fireweed Collective and Survived and Punished New York to bring you these workshops. Huge thanks to both of these amazing organizations we encourage everyone to check out their work via the links in the event description. I'm happy once again to be introducing Dean Spade, who has been such an amazing longtime collaborative partner for me and has worked with BCRW to create videos and programming on mutual aid, prison abolition, queer liberation, disability justice, and transformative justice. Dean Spade is the author of Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next, as well as normal life, administrative violence, critical trans politics, and the limits of the law. Dean teaches at Seattle University School of Law and has been working in social movements and prisons, borders, poverty, and war for over two decades. I'll bring Dean on now and we can get started. Thank you so much, Hope. And thank you to the interpreters and the captioner and to Sophie for so much work in the background making this happen. And um, to all of you for coming. I, I thought that the last workshop was really fun and people had great energy and I'm excited about um, what will happen in the next ones. In the last workshop, I said I was gonna continue with the parts of the slides I didn't get to that were about like procrastination and kind of like accountability in our work. But I'm actually gonna save that for a future workshop and focus today um, entirely on um, this bigger topic of decision making um, because I feel like it's kind of its own chunk. So we'll come back to that stuff. Um, and if you missed the last workshop, as Hope said, you can just watch the video on the BCRW website. All right, so I'm going to share my slides. I think that they are they up? Think they are okay. So a couple um, access uh, matters related to um, 
today's workshop. Um, it's totally fine to not participate in the interactive polls that I'll be putting up. Um, it's, uh, I wanted to mention that the live transcription link is in the chat. It's also on Twitter and it's also on YouTube underneath the video and it's on the events webpage. Um, I'm gonna read what's on my slides. So it's fine if you don't wanna look at the screen and I'll read some of what is coming up in the polls and in the chat, but there'll be a lot cause there's a lot of people here. Um, but I'll read things that I want to emphasize. Um, I know a lot of people have a hard time looking at the screen for a long time, or maybe you've had to look at it a lot today already. So it's fine to just listen to this and feel free to take breaks as you need. Um, this is being recorded. The video will be up and so will a PDF of the slides and the poll results. So you can look at it all in more detail at another time. The things I want to try to do today, we'll see what we get through. Um, I want to talk briefly, I mentioned this at the beginning of the last workshop, but I think it's a framing that's important for anyone who's new to this workshop, why I think we should make our groups or uh, organize horizontally. Um, I want to talk about today primarily a few key elements that we can put into group structure that help make decision making work um, and are also just important for other reasons. So how to make your group have teams, how to have clear understanding of who's who's in the group and who's not, um, how to do planning so that we can implement things through teams and um, various points around decision-making and facilitation. That's like the main focus today. Um, all right, let's do a couple polls just to talk about who's here. So um, Hope, can we bring down my slides and Sophie, can we bring up the first poll? So we're using this thing Mentimeter and um, we did this question last time, but let's just do it today to see who's here. What does your group, your mutual aid group provide? So if you're part of a group already, like what does it provide? Or if you're starting a group, um, what does that group provide? Are you guys doing food, clothes? Are you doing eviction defense? Are you doing childcare? Um, so people can go ahead and use the link and um, that I, uh, the code that's on this slide, 16984092 at menti.com. Or I think there's also a link in the chat and we can see what people are saying their groups are providing appearing on the screen. Food, clothes, prisoner support, medical supplies, homeless support, toiletries, groceries, water, cash, eviction defense, bike repair, community defense, food delivery, firearm training, household items. It starts to get teeny tiny soon, but it'll be, it, it was fun to look at this in more detail last time after the session, um, just to see what people are putting out. Prisoner support, maybe I already said that. Tool library. Someone's writing the chat, sex worker wellness drop-in center. Hygiene kits. Training. Great, so we're just getting a sense of what kinds of mutual aid groups are here. Community. Food is again the biggest one, which it was the last time too. Encampment support is another big one. A lot of people supporting unhoused people, I think in this room right now. Great, thank you all. And as I mentioned, these poll results can be, will be something you can look at um, after we'll put the PDF up of all of them. And I also posted them to social media last time. All right, let's go to the second poll when you're ready, Sophie. I'm curious um, how many people are active in your group right now. Let's see how these how big these groups are. Just to forewarn you, the next question is going to be how many are active decision makers in your group. So this is just like how many are active at all. Like they're you know volunteering once in a while, or they're all there all the time. Like what's what would you say is like the total number of the community of people 
that are in your group in one way or another, like the kind of bigger count. So far, it looks like that we got a lot of people who have five to 10 people in their group. We've got a good number of people who have 10 to 20. We've got some groups that have more than 75 people in them. That is really exciting. A good number of groups that have 30 to 50 people in them. Great. It's cool to see. For some reason, there's very few groups that have 50 to 75 people in them. <laughs> Yeah, and now that the winner right now is 10 to 20 people in the groups. Great. Sophie, let's do the next poll. How many people are in act, doing active decision making in your group right now about important decisions? This might be less than the total number of people who have some kind of role in your group or sometimes show up to help out. So yeah, it seems like not surprisingly, it's often less people than the total number of people who do something. A lot of groups that are one to five or five to 10 people. It's helpful to think about this because when we're making decisions in groups of different sizes, it requires different kinds of facilitation. So it's nice to just kind of see what are people working with, but there are some groups here that have 30 to 50 people making important decisions together, which is really cool. Great. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to my slides if that's okay. Okay. All right, so I just wanna go over this briefly again. I know some of you heard it last time, but um, can't hurt to be refreshed too. Um, and also because a lot of us probably have to have this conversation a lot, like why should our group work in this way that's different than the way like all of our schools and jobs and churches work? Um, so the reason that, um, I think it's important to have our groups operate horizontally or many. One is that we see again and again that hierarchies invite abuse and that we see that they reproduce racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, and other patterns of oppression. Just like we constantly hear stories about situations in which one person has the most status in a group and they use it to exploit or abuse other people. Also, we believe, or I really believe that people generate more wisdom when they think of solutions and plans together. Like when you have more perspectives, when people have different life experiences, they'll notice different things that would be obstacles to some people that others wouldn't have thought of. They'll have creative ideas as a group that are richer and more complex and inclusive than just one person or a very small group of people deciding everything. A really important one is that people implement work more fully when they have a say in it. So we see this a lot in our paid jobs. Like if the boss tells us to do it a certain way and it's not the way that people who work there think would work well, they just don't do it or they keep doing it the other way, you know, as much as they can get away with it. Um, and when we have most of our mutual aid groups, and we saw this last time I did polls around it, most mutual aid groups are all people who are volunteers or mostly people who are volunteers. And most mutual aid groups will be unpaid because the amount of mutual aid we need in our society to survive is far higher than the amount of like grants or whatever. Um, and we want to do work that's accountable to our communities, not to funders or the government. So inevitably, most of this work will be unpaid and most mutual aid and social movement work has always been unpaid. So given that people aren't going to stick around if they're being bossed around to do work in a way that they don't think is aligned with why they're passionate and why they showed up. So having people have a say in the work they're doing is like ethical and it means they stick around and implement it together. When people work together and decide things together, they tend to stick to their values. It's much easier for somebody to sell out who's in charge. It's much easier for the group to like drift from its purpose 
towards something that, you know, the elites want or a funder wants or some powerful group wants if there's just one person to buy off. So, you know, we're just stronger in sticking to our values when we do it together. And the final sort of big reason is that, you know, we're facing disastrous times, both the ongoing disasters we've been living under and new levels of um, crisis and disaster from climate crisis and the further concentrating of wealth and all of these conditions. And we want a lot of people to get skilled up to save each other's lives, reduce suffering and fight back. And so the more people who can take more responsibility for the work, the more we have people who have all those skills instead of creating a dynamic where a few people have leadership skills and everybody else has followership skills. We want people to be active and feel like they can take responsibility and start projects and move things um, because we there's just so much unmet need and uh, so much to do to build powerful resistance. So we want like more people taking up more room and movements, not just following instructions from somebody on top and kind of continuing the training and passivity that we all get in an authoritarian society. This is my famous graphic <laughs> that I'm so proud I made as I love a rainbow. Um, this image of imagining that our groups, that the job of our groups is to bring more people deeper into the work so that people on the outer layers of this target are people who are just getting into our group, just finding out about it, or they heard about it on social media, or they came and got one thing from us that we give out, um, you know, or they read a flyer and they're, and that we are trying to bring them to the center. We're trying to be like, oh, would you come to a meeting? Oh, would you like to come to a training? Oh, would you like to uh, you know, help help facilitate the next meeting? Would you like to help train the next new people who are entering so that we move people towards more and more and more responsibility in the group, more and more responsibility to support others and bring other people in that we're just growing people. People are taking up more space, building more skills, like coming more to the center of the work. And the way we do the work should keep bringing more people towards the center and towards decision-making instead of having just a few people being deciders and everybody else staying on the outer rim as like, um, you know how like nonprofits have volunteers who just like stuff envelopes or just like make a call once a year. Like we don't like that very thin relationship to the work. It's, it's, it's not nothing, but we want, we want to be moving people towards more and more and more like stewardship of the work. We want people to get so many skills from coming through and becoming part of our organization that they could start another one like it or something better or, or split it off. We're gonna split off into two because it's gotten so big and it's serving two neighborhoods or we're gonna have, you know, they move to another part of town and then they start another version of it. We want people to have that much um, like skill development and sense of ownership and stewardship. So what we're trying to cultivate just as a reminder, you know, at least my take on this when I think about these workshops, we're trying to build groups that are good at transparency where people in the groups and people who are getting stuff from the groups and other groups in town, like really know like what this group does, how it works, you know, where the money comes from, if there's money involved, where it goes, you know, how decisions are made, just like that it's, there's no like secrecy um, surrounding the group's work. Obviously there may be need for some level of secrecy or security if you're doing work that's against the law. That's of course legitimate, but in terms of like, um, most people's mutual aid work and even parts of um, mutual aid work that where other parts might be more um, important to have security around. Um, we want accountability to community. We want organizations um, and groups to not like sell out, right? We want them to consistently stick to their values. We want wise action influenced by many people's wisdom rather than somebody dominating. We want groups that care about the most vulnerable first. So groups that are really thinking about intersectional harm in people's lives and going to the center of vulnerability and crisis rather than trying to go to like who's most palatable within a, an affected group. We want groups that feel in a sense of abundance and sharing and like a broader movement that feels like that. Like we all have each other's backs. We we care about what other groups are doing and we're showing up for them too. We're 
solving problems in a way that feels like there's plenty to go around and we, we've got each other, um, even though, of course, we're living under conditions that are harsh. We want groups that have clear plans, like we know what we're doing and why, and clear boundaries about what we don't do. So we are not making promises in the community that then people are like, wait, somebody from your group told me you'd showed up and then you didn't show up. Um, we wanna know what we do and what we don't do. We're like, oh, we're not doing that right now because this other group does that or because we don't have enough people right now and we know we don't do that. Um, so I wanna talk about four of these five elements of structure and in another workshop, I'll talk about one of them. So today I want us to talk about teams and why I think it's useful to have teams membership, like why it's important to know who's in our group and not, and just some of the things that, that can help if it comes up. We're going to talk about decision making, we're going to talk about planning. And in another workshop, I want to talk more about pathways for new people to join and stay in our group. I think this is really vital for mutual aid groups for two reasons. One, because mutual aid, as I've said a lot, is like the main on-ramp for people into our movements. People either show up because they need something and our mutual aid groups say, yeah, we've got that to share with you. And also we think it's messed up that you don't have that. And we blame the system, not you. And do you want to join work to fight this for everybody? Right. Do you want to join organizing about this for tenants throughout the city or on your block? So it's like mutual aid is like the way people enter movements often because it's one of the first places they heard something affirming about the crisis they're living through not being their fault and that they could join collective action against it. And a lot of people join movements because they show up to mutual aid work because they're mad that something's happening to others. Maybe they've been through it before or they heard about it and they want to help, which is beautiful. And so it's this place people come into our movements and then often build a broader politics of solidarity, get involved in bolder and bolder action. And so it's vital that our groups actually be able to let new people in and it's also important because there can be a tendency for, you know, two or four people to start a group and never really share decision-making or responsibility and get really burned out. And so then we haven't, and maybe the work ends because of conflict. So we haven't really made the movement bigger and we definitely can't win or survive unless our movements get a lot bigger. So our mutual aid groups are a vital space for building capacity to meet survival needs and build bigger mobilizations. So yeah, we're gonna come back to the pathways for new people to join. I'll mention a few things about it today in some of these sections. Okay, oh, it's interesting that, oh, there's, I see what's happening. Let's see, it's interesting. It's not running through, well, okay. Um, it's not running through my animation exactly, but that's fine. Um, so teams. Um, I have found it helpful in groups to have teams. A lot of times when groups start, it's just like we all meet to talk about everything, which makes sense. But eventually, um, as our work starts to develop, it can be really helpful to be like, oh, like we don't all have to meet for everything. We can implement this work through teams. We can kind of know the general plan and then there can be specific teams that implement the parts of it that they're good at. So typically this kind of emerges organically. Like maybe there's a communications team and that team runs our website and puts up our flyers in the neighborhood if we're using paper flyers or does our social media or um, if we're writing press releases, does that, you know, like um, maybe we have a fundraising team because we are raising money to buy this food and toiletries we're giving out or whatever. And so there's a team working on that. Maybe there's a team that answers our hotline and coordinates training people to answer the hotline or um, a team that organizes the distribution of when we give out this stuff and bring it to the places we give it out or whatever. I mean, whatever is the kind of organic um, tasks that tend to get kind of clumped. Um, and team structures are great to try out. And then sometimes you'll be like, oh, this team actually should be two teams or actually these two teams should be one team. You know, it's fine for it to just constantly change and, um, and shift according to experimentation. I encourage people to add a team that most groups forget to create, which is some kind of team 
that cares about how our group works. In a lot of groups I've been in, we've called that the collective development team, or people call it the group culture team, or the care and feeding team. You know, you could come up with any creative name for it. But part of what this workshop series is about is moving from just thinking about what's what we do out there to being like, and how is it going in here? Oh, none of my animation is working. I wonder why that is. Okay. Um, so that team ha has kind of like maybe the following types of tasks. One is they might be really thinking about how to bring new people in. When we got, when we talk about pathways for new people, we will talk about like making sure you have orientations for them and training them on the stuff that the group does and how it does it and its history. Like how do people who come in know enough about the group to participate fully? So um, this team would think about that perhaps. They would think about making sure we meet to do planning, making sure we meet to, to go over like, yeah, this is how much money we're trying to raise and how we're gonna spend it. Um, they might be the team in charge of thinking about group culture. Like we're gonna have a disability justice training or um, we're gonna have a training where we talk about how to give and receive feedback, or we're gonna have a training where we talk together about capacity and how we wanna talk to each other about capacity. In general, this team thinks about the internal infrastructure and tools, like how is it going in here? What do we wanna skill up? Are there people missing? Are we creating an environment that's unfriendly and keeping some people out of our group? Is there conflict here that could be prevented or attended to like that kind of like what's going on in here? And I just name that because it's often the team that people forget to create. I'm just going to like see if I do this, whether I could make it go a little bit like actually use my, oh, maybe it's going to actually use my, okay. Okay. So that's the story with teams. We can come back to that, but I just recommend that if group, sometimes when, sometimes groups I'm talking to, it's like they're all on one big signal thread. It's overwhelming how to read it all. All the decisions are happening everywhere. It can be really useful if the group has a pretty clear plan and I'll get to planning to be like, oh, now these people, they just do the chunk of implementing that part of the plan and they get to have their own signal thread or email list or whatever you're using. And you do need to find what, some way to make sure that the teams report back to the whole group, like at some reasonable interval so that everyone knows what's going on. And so then maybe it's that once a month we have a meeting of everyone and we get little reports from the teams or maybe the teams post little reports on signal or on our website or something in some way, whatever tools we're using for communication. You don't want the teams to become so siloed that people don't know what's going on on the other team. And that can create conflict um, because people feel like it's a click or they disagree with something another team's doing and they didn't get to give feedback. So we want to have enough transparency, but also like people are allowed to go ahead and implement without everybody having to decide everything together. It's like a matter of like efficiency and transparency. The second piece I, I just want to name is membership, like how we know who is in and who is not in our group. Um, and the reason this matters is because we're going to talk about consensus decision making for the bulk of our time today. And in consensus decision making, people who are in the group can block decisions, can say like, that doesn't work for me and we can't move forward because I'm really concerned about that. And so we wanna know who's in the group so that random people can't come in and block our decisions. <laughs> you know, like we don't wanna have a group that's so tight that people can't enter and leave or that isn't flexible enough to recognize people's lives. You know, some people can't come every time, but that's okay. But we wanna have some way of knowing who's not in the group so that we're not open to just like someone showing up with bad intentions um, and, and just trying to like stop our work. Um, also, we wanna know who to inform about group happenings and decisions. We'll talk about this later, but you know, we wanna be able to make decisions and make sure people in the group know about the decisions. And if someone's not really in the group anymore or like wasn't in the group, we, we don't need to like be over communicating with them maybe, like making sure that we know like who we're actually managing to inform. 
we want to know how to tell if someone's left. You know, if I haven't been to any of the meetings in six months, I shouldn't be able to show up and block the decisions, you know, and bring the group to a screeching halt. So how do we have some kind of clarity around like when someone can't do that and, and how they get back in if they're ready? Not about excluding people, but just about not making ourselves vulnerable to like the potential drama of that. Um, yeah. So um, Sophie, if you'd be willing, will you put in the chat the link to, um, to the sample example membership um, proposal that I created? So I, this, I just am giving you guys an example. We're gonna talk a lot today about the idea that in consensus decision-making, what we're doing is we're bringing proposals to our group. Um, we're saying like, could it work like this? Could it work like this? And then let's massage it and make it better. So this is an example of a proposal that I wrote for a group I was in. This was a group um, where we were like, okay, we wanna have three levels. Like people can be core members who like make the big decisions about the group. We're gonna have people who are, you know, on a team that, that anyone who's on a team is part of the core. And then also you could just be a volunteer to a team. Like the distribution team could just have like a bunch of people who just show up on certain days, but they don't want to be part of the group. They don't want to come to big decision making, but that's fine. Like we've got a broader field of people who like want to do work with the group and they do work with this particular team, but they're not like thinking with the rest of us about the budget or whatever. So this group, like that was its its model. You could, there's a million different ways to make a model, but this is just an example. Um, and so this was just a, a, a proposal I made about how people move from being a volunteer to a team to like becoming a team member and a core member. Um, and also it talks about how we know when somebody, like if somebody has missed five meetings in a row of the core, we're going to say they're not in it until they like say, hey, I want to come back just so that we can know when someone's like not in it. So they can't show up and disrupt. Um, and there's some notes at the bottom about other things that could go in the proposal in the future. So this is just one example of a proposal. There's a million versions of this. I just wanted to give an example. Um, I, as I mentioned in the note on this proposal, I drafted this for a group that actually did face a danger of like police infiltration. So we had kind of a little bit of a stricter like actually vetting people, you know, some groups might have a looser, like anyone can come to the core meeting. It's fine. Like, and we, we, we aren't worried about people coming with the intent to disrupt or to, you know, um, throw in unnecessarily blo unnecessary blocks. It just depends on how, what kind of security issues the particular work you're doing has. We're trying to find that balance all the time between making a group too tight and secure so that new, new people new people can't enter and people inside are likely to burn out or making a group so wide open that people can come in with bad intentions and destroy the work so it's like i think that i think in my experience a lot of us have um a lot of us have a personality tendency. I am an over includer. I'm like, I think I want everyone to come. And I have friends who are like overly secure and they're just like suspicious of everybody. And it's great to have people in groups who have each of those tendencies and everything in between. Cause hopefully we can find a balance. Like neither of those things are a totally great plan, you know, and trying to learn if you have a tendency in one direction or another. So that rather than being like my, ten my, what I believe is true, you're just like, oh no, I have a tendency. I'm going to listen to her. She has the other tendency, probably the truth is somewhere in between here, um, can be a kind of self-awareness. That's helpful. Um, and we can talk, we can have more question and answer about this um, during the Q&A, but I just wanted to give a sense of like what, just that it's useful to have some idea about what constitutes membership and so who, who can make what kinds of decisions or who can block what kinds of decisions. Most of the time in consensus, there shouldn't be a lot of blocking going on. And we'll talk about this more, but you know, people bring a proposal, we listen for concerns, we, we alter the proposal to try to make it work for more people. And we're moving towards like, what could make this work? You know, Or we're like, oh, wow, we need to do more research. We got to scrap this for now and then come back with a new idea. But 
there shouldn't be a ton of blocking. So if there's not a block happening, it's fine for people who are newer to the group or who were not sure how long they're staying to give their feedback. Like it's, it, they're not gonna, they, they can't derail it. It's only if someone's coming in and is like blocking it and we're like, but wait, who are you? You've never done anything with this group before. <laughs> you know, that's when it starts to be, or we haven't seen you in six months. And now you're coming here and telling us to stop this thing we've all been working on developing. You know, those are the moments where it starts to matter. Like maybe we don't have to let this person block. Okay, I wanna talk a bit about planning. Sorry, this workshop is more like me laying things out than the last one, a little bit less interactive, but I wanna just kind of put all this stuff in front of you and then we can talk about it. So it's really helpful when groups get to make big plans that are clear. Um, it lets teams implement them. So if we have a plan that we don't all have to come back and talk about it all every time, because we already made like the big decision, we're doing six events this year, or uh, we're gonna be at the courthouse every Tuesday or whatever. Um, and then we can make it all happen instead of always deciding it fresh. Um, it gives broad strokes that people can fill in in the teams. It helps us know what we agreed to. So like, we're like, yep, we all said six events. And then also we can be like, someone can come in and be like, you guys, I wanna propose that we actually move to four events. And then we'll know, oh, we changed our mind. Like, like just a lot of groups like aren't sure if they made a decision sometimes. Um, so just being like, oh, we made a decision, we are aware of it. And it doesn't mean we can't revisit it, but we'll, we'll know when we're revisiting it. Like, so that everybody knows what's going on. Um, it really helps if we are trying to bring new people in that they can, we can tell them what the plan is, right? Like, it's just like so much easier to become part of a group if you know what the plan is. Um, in a lot of groups, there's a dynamic where people will take on new work for the group without asking everybody, especially like founders and workaholics. And so if there's just like a plan that we do six events or we table every Tuesday, I can't go out and meet with someone in the community and tell them, oh yeah, the group will be there on Wednesday too, without asking everybody else. Like it's just, let's, it reminds us all that I'm part of a group and I can't just do whatever I want and promise things from us that we didn't all decide we had capacity to do. And when we make the big plan, it often is a moment where we're like, right, our priorities. Okay, we really want to center black neighborhoods in this, or we really want to make sure this is done in a way that has, that doesn't contribute to pollution or whatever. Like it lets us make a plan where we talk about why we're not doing it this or that way, or why we're choosing this between these options. We're going to prioritize these people or this place. Um, and that um, means that we kind of came up with the big plan with our values in mind. There's a lot of different ways to do planning that, you know, depend on what stage your group is in, like whether we're just like, we just met each other, we're going to make a plan for the following month, you know, versus we're making a rough plan for the year. I'm just going to share like a framework I've used in some groups that feel like they are going to stick around for a while. So it can be really helpful for a group to have like a work plan, especially like a team work plan, like the comms team does these things, you know, it could be annual or it could be just a floating work plan, but it's like the comms team. We maintain the website, you know, once a month we make changes to the website. We post things on social media each time the group is doing a tabling event or a distribution. We, you know, whatever our, is in our work plan, we um, need a flyer on Fridays and with throughout the, the, the three encampments in our city, whatever our communications plan is, or we're the fundraising team. We, do three GoFundMes a year, or we signal boost these community members GoFundMes, or we write these grants, like whatever it is. So having team work plans, it's like a way of having a clear plan. Um, and then people on other teams can read it and be like, oh, right, that's like, yes, that's what they're doing. Or actually, you guys, this seems, this is off from what we're doing. Can we adjust this? It's like a way to build that transparency. Like we all know what's going on. If you're a group that has paid people, which I think most groups at these workshops are not, I think it's really useful to have individual work plans for those people as a matter of transparency for other unpaid people in the group to be able to know what the paid people are supposed to do. And there's some like accountability around that. 
And also it helps support paid people to know what they're supposed to do with their time when there's a lot probably being asked of them. And so it means the group agreed, this was the work plan for this person. This is what their priorities are supposed to be. And so if they get asked to do other stuff, they can say, I, I'm supposed to do this stuff on my work plan. So it's like um, helpful for, and you could also have unpaid people choose to have work plans um, if you want to build out that much uh, like planning. And the idea, I think if you're doing this on an annual thing is like we, let's say we all get together in January or whatever, and we make kind of this annual plan, like what are the team's work plans, kind of what's the plan, of, and then, you know, the plan of the whole group is just the collection of teamwork plans, like that's the work. Um, then, you know, we're going to get together again in June and be like, how's it going? Maybe we needed to change things. Or maybe, maybe in April, something came up, a crisis in our community, and we decided to change it. That's okay. You can always change these plans because of conditions. Um, but we might also intend to check in every six months about the plans. Did some stuff not happen? Why? Is that cool? Or do we want to catch up on that stuff? And I think this is true too for groups that have budgets. Some groups don't have budgets. Some groups are not giving away something that they have to buy or whatever. But you know, money is where a lot of breakdown happens in groups. So having transparency and clarity around money is really good. Um, and so creating some kind of budget and then checking in like, oh, it's been six months. We spent less on this than we thought we would. We spent more on this than we thought we would. This money came in, this money didn't come in that we thought would like just having everyone get to know about that is really conflict preventing. And so what I'm, you know, suggesting is that in a lot of groups I'm in, you know, throughout the months you're doing team meetings, you might be having a meeting of the whole group, but like twice a year you have some kind of like longer meeting, maybe you call it a retreat or whatever, where you're like really thinking about the budgets, you're really making sure people are deeply updated on each other's, on each, each team's work, and maybe you're doing some other stuff together, like doing anti-oppression training together or celebrating your victories together or, you know, just building your relationships together. Like you're getting together in like a special way once in a while where you're like digging deep. That's just one way you could frame planning, but a lot of groups I talk to just aren't doing planning at all. So it's just like, oh wait, someone said we're going to be here this weekend, but someone else said we don't have enough people to, to, to you know, person that this weekend, you know, that kind of like, what are we doing? Um, and then the ball gets dropped. So I think having some kind of planning that's realistic and where people have talked about, like, do we have the capacity to do that work? Is that the right amount to, to say we're gonna do? All of those questions. Okay. So I wanna talk about consensus decision-making. Oh, I didn't do this one, yeah. Um, Oh yeah, we did some, but some people already answered it. Let's do, let's do the fourth poll, Sophie. Um, what's difficult about decision making in your group? All right, burnout, difficulty with consensus, past conflict, yeah. Lacking information. It's so tiny. Maybe I can make it bigger on my screen. Urgency, not wanting to overstep. People having a stake, white supremacy. Positionality, not everyone there at the meeting, yeah. Absences, not a shared vocabulary time, lack of clarity, we have children, conflicts of interest, lack of engagement, absence is getting pretty big, yeah, capacity, Cool to see what people are saying. There's a lot around urgency, consensus, and past conflict. Ego is on there. 
Yeah. Great. This is really helpful just to see what's what's hard for folks in decision making. Abusing values. Great. Let's go to this next um, one, Sophie. So let's talk about what are our fears about consensus decision making? I know a lot of people, when I talk about it in different workshops, are like, I'm worried that that's going to be bad for us in various ways, or I've had a bad experience, and now I'm scared of it for our group. So I'd love to hear people's fears. Nothing will ever get done. <laughs> Gonna make the wrong decision. Hmm. Others wanting to stray from our values, having the group feel included, people judging how I process, too hard to, reduce, to reverse a consensus decision, inefficiency, too slow, slips into political ideology, what if we never reach consensus? That no one will feel full ownership of a decision to see it to the end. That's really interesting. Lack of productivity, lack of movement. The least effective thing will pass. It takes a long time. Privileged voices are given equal time as oppressed voices. People will be left out. Too much back and forth so we never make an actual decision. Personal conflict will get in the way of what is best for the group differing values, time management, decisions that don't match values, too easy to block or veto the work. Yeah, no follow-up. Yeah, these are really helpful. Taking so long that it prevents any action, especially when needs arise so quickly in our communities. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Unchecked biases and power. We won't know how to define quorum, quorum or consensus. Yeah, like we're enough people here to make this decision. Someone feels left out or agreed to just agree to not create an issue. Uh-huh. I worry that others might be afraid to tell me I'm misinformed. Keeping everyone on the same page and getting people to keep the big picture in mind. Conflicts. Yeah, people with less capacity making decisions than leaving it to others to do the work. Yeah, that's hard. People will disrupt decisions for the fun of it. Great. Yeah, these, there's tons, 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 tons of great concerns. Yeah. Um, blocking is a way to, for people, folks to feel validated. Yeah. Factions form and block any kind of decision making. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great. These are great. Thank you all. Um, yeah, that it's performative and not really consensus. Yeah. People see concerns about a proposal and as ganging up on the person making the proposal. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the slides. I think that um, <laughs> a lot of these things, of course, can happen in any kind of decision making. Um, so that some of them are things that are about which kind we use and some of them are about the power dynamics that are real in our groups. Let's talk about a few, a few things. So I think some of the reasons that I think consensus decision making is the path we should be trying is that we make better decisions because we actually have heard people's concerns and tried to address them. If the alternative is to either have like somebody be like the director and make the decisions or majorities vote, then we are just agreeing to like not address lots of people's concerns or leave out people who are in the minority. And that could mean we're leaving out people who have experiences that really matter to our community, but are just not the bulk of the people in our group. Um, I think I think it produces better implementation because we all were part of making the decision. So we're willing and interested in implementing it. We We were heard. Even if we didn't get our number one, we got to talk about and hear why like it's worth it to move forward with something that's like maybe good enough for us. Like most people can mostly agree to. 
And I think that the, the skills produced by doing consensus decision-making together really matter. I think they help us learn how to be cooperative, how to be collaborative, and to create a group atmosphere that fosters cohesion and connection. Um, ultimately, when we're practicing consensus decision-making, we can learn the skill of being like, rather than being right or winning a vote, I want to hear what other people think about my proposal that's different so that I can make it better, so we can make it better. So rather than like, I brought it and I want to get Dean's idea through and I want to steamroll anyone who disagrees with me, I'm instead saying, here's this idea. Let's make it better together and then do something that's the best possible thing with all of our wisdom. So I don't, I'm not owning this proposal. I'm just like, I'm initiating this and then I'm letting it get tweaked and massaged and improved by everybody's at best ideas. And then when it gets to a place that we can all live with, we go, <laughs> you know? And then at any point when we've made a decision that way, we can revisit it. We can be like, oh, I wanna propose that we change what we all agreed to last time because we've learned this new information or it's not working out. And then we bring that proposal. And so there's this sense of learning and growing instead of winning. Um, I think that is at, at its best what consensus can allow. Things that make it more likely to go well, <laughs> if the group has a clear common purpose. If we know why we're here, then even if we disagree, we're more likely to be able to know what we're arguing about. And like, it'll actually, we'll get more groceries delivered if we do it this way. And, or someone's like, you know, uh, we'll reach people who are struggling harder if we do it this way. Like we know what we believe in um, and what we're trying to do. And so then we can have a useful learning debate about which things will get us there. It's easier to do consensus decision-making when we trust each other. <laughs> a lot of you mentioned in the fears um, poll just now, the way that conflict can disrupt consensus decision-making. So if I just am really mad at Hope and Sophie and we're in a group trying to make decisions this way and I, whatever they say, I'm just like, no, like I've lost, I'm no longer speaking to the purpose of our group. I'm just, against Hope and Sophie and whatever they say, um, yeah, I could really slow us down. So this is why, and we're gonna have a whole workshop on like conflict in groups. And I hope you all know that um, Interrupting Criminalization is uh, doing a workshop on Thursday, November 18th about conflict in groups that I'm really excited about and that you can register for. Maybe someone could put that in the chat, the link, um, but I would recommend going to that. Um, but this is why we need to do a lot of work in our groups to actually try to build trust, create good group culture, do feedback together in ways that are useful. And so that we don't have these like pitched conflicts that, you know, where we can choose to try to destroy the group by creating factions or, you know, um, opposing everything somebody says because we don't like them. Um, yeah, that that makes decision making fall apart, kind of no matter what decision making structure you have. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. I think it's useful to know that uh, trust is not something that is always easy to build. Um, there's good reasons why people don't trust each other. Like there may be people in your group who don't trust men or who don't trust white people or whatever. Like there's good reasons that people have adapted to, you know, not trust because of experiences they've had. So I think the question is less is, is often, how do I become trustworthy? How do I act in ways in a group that show that I'm listening, that I'm um, doing what I said I would do, that I um, admit mistakes. Like how can we all be trying to become trustworthy? And how do I experiment with ways I might try to be more trusting when it's appropriate? Like, oh, I noticed that I'm, you know, feel really untrusting of everyone in this group. Is there any room for me to play with that? Is there anything that might be influencing me that's deeply about past experiences that, am I able to let in new data too about whether people are being trustworthy? And it's not about pressuring us to trust each other. It's about having some self-awareness around our own trusting or lack of trustingness and around our own trustworthiness. Like we are all on a path to hopefully like do healing that allows us to be more trustworthy and do healing that allows us to trust people when they're trustworthy, you know? Um, and so I think just like even 
noticing if you have a tendency there, if you have a tendency to be very trusting kind of to a fault or to be untrusting in a way that blocks potential connection and collaboration that could be useful to you or the group. And just like not being, not judging ourselves for that, but being like, hmm, is this a space where I could see any transformation of that? Could I try trusting people who are acting trustworthy? Could I tell a group what makes me feel more trust in a space? Could we have a workshop about building trust? I don't know, you know, there's like, th this is really compl complex, but it will be easier and easier to make decisions together when we've seen each other follow through, listen to each other, actually care about other people's experiences, like that's what builds our trust, right? When we felt, when we've created a culture that makes people feel belonging in the group. Um, so yeah, this is a tall order. I think, you know, I strongly believe that most of the harm we experience in our lives happens in groups like families and schools and churches and workplaces. And most of the healing that we can experience in our lives happens in groups. Like groups are a very profound place for healing where we can have experiences we've never had before, feeling seen, belonging, feeling safe, feeling cared for, feeling like someone has our back. And so we wanna build groups where people can experience that kind of healing. So how do I, how do I show up to a group that could be a place like that for me and others? Like these are like deep questions that relate to this. Consensus decision-making works better when people understand the process. And most people have never been in spaces that were not dominated by an authority. So we do need to make sure, especially with new people in our group, that we keep talking about how the consensus process works. And good facilitators will remind people how we're making this decision and what some of our values are about that every time we are making a decision together so that new people can join and so that all of us can remember. If I came in here with a big grudge against Hope and Sophie, maybe reminding me what the purpose of the group is and how we make decisions together might help me not play that out when we go into this discussion of Hope and Sophie's proposal. Um, it might help me keep the best interests of the group at the center, which is what allows consensus decision-making to work well. And it can be really hard when instead I'm focused on my grudge. This is huge. I'm gonna talk about this in a moment in the facilitation section, but in many groups, um, people just show up to meetings. No one's done any work in between to prepare or think about what the meeting will be like or to give people something to think like here, I'm, I'm sending out this proposal for people to chew on before the meeting and maybe even send me back thoughts if you, if you have suggestions before the meeting. And then when we have the conversation, we've all already chewed on it a bit. Like doing things between meetings to prepare for meetings makes the time be used much better and can make people feel a lot more satisfaction in the consensus process. And so we really need skillful facilitation and agenda, prepar agenda preparation. And I'm gonna talk about facilitation a bit here and also give you guys a bunch of resources Facilitation is a really huge skill that we need like everyone to be learning and it's a lifelong skill and there's lots of great writing and vid videos and stuff about it. Um, but we really need everyone in our groups to be learning this. Um, and facilitation is so vital during crises and disasters when it's time for groups of people to make hard decisions together and to share resources in the face of scarcity and danger. So the more we have this skill, the more prepared we are for the coming disasters. So this is a, a, an image which, you know, you can look at it if you want to, you don't need to, I'm gonna talk us through it. There's a lot of different flow charts like this on the internet that talk about what the sort of flow of consensus decision-making is. This may be very familiar to some people, but I wanna briefly go through it for people for whom it's new. The basic idea of consensus is that we're having some kind of conversation. There's some kind of proposal emerging, like, I think we should be at the courthouse on Tuesdays. And then people talk about concerns, like, I don't know, Tuesdays is, you know, actually the day the courts only open till three, or um, Tuesdays is the day where a lot of people in our group can't go because there's a meeting of the other coalition on Tuesdays or whatever. 
And then we adjust it. Someone's like, how about Wednesday night? Or how about Wednesday at noon? And then other people are like, okay. So we've got a modified proposal now. It's going to be Wednesdays. And then we assess the degree of support. Are most people feeling pretty good about that? Is, are there any other concerns that we haven't dealt with? And if people are feeling pretty good and there's no more, no one's identifying any, any more concerns, then we say, oh, have we reached consensus? Does anyone have any opposition? And we may have reached consensus. Or if not, maybe there's more concerns and we go back and talk about more concerns and modify more. That's the basic, I mean, we do this all the time in our friendships. I think I used this example in the last workshop. I'm like, Hope, do you want to get dinner on Friday? Hope's like, no, I can do Saturday. I'm like, okay, I can do Saturday too. I'm like, do you want to go to the place on the corner? Hope's like, no, people don't wear masks there. It makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, what about the place near my house that we like? Hope's like, okay, we've just modified the proposal. Now we're going Saturday to the place near my house. We both agree. Like that's, we just did the consensus process, right? In, in groups, like mutual aid groups, there might be multiple meetings here. It might've been that in, you know, in the meeting in the first week of November, we started discussing adding a new date for distribution. And then we said, okay, you know, Sophie and Dean are going to go, go on and uh, make um, a generative proposal about that. They're going to do a little bit of research, try to figure out if it, if it should be on Mondays or if it should be at the beginning of the month or whatever, they're going to come back with a proposal. And so then the next meeting we talk about Sophie and Dean's proposal and we realize, oh, there's some unsatisfied concerns that actually need more, more research and a new proposal. So then we deal with that. And so it could be three meetings before we get to the decision-making moment, or it could all happen in one meeting, depending on like how big this thing is and is there research needed? And, you know, did we, while we were discussing it, did we realize, oh, wait, we need some people to go off and do some more work on this. So this might have, this process might happen over a period of meetings rather than just in quickly. But that's the basic idea of consensus decision making. And it's, I think, as I mentioned in the last workshop, most of us have done this more in our friendships than anywhere else. Um, because anywhere else, like in blood families and in jobs and in churches, someone's bossing us around. So I wanna talk a little bit about the facilitation that helps us get there. And I think I wanna just do a quick poll um, Sophie, can we pull up the what are the qualities of good facilitation poll? Curious what people have noticed helps with facilitation. What makes it good? What do you what do you like in good facilitation? Adaptable, good listener, experience, neutrality, confidence, time management, clarity, flexible, minds people's speaking. Oh, sorry, I think minding people's speaking. People were really loving experience, active listening, joyful. Try to make this bigger so I can see these little words. No editorializing, taking stack. We'll talk about stack. Silence. It sounds like people like a good pause. Inclusion, humor, friendly. Shared plan. Empathy and compassion. Clarity. Openness. Patience. Shares power. Visual. Assumes best intentions, summarization, engaging, inclusive. This is great. Honesty, calmness. Questions, great. Thanks, Sophie. Let's go back to the slides. Great. So um, facilitation, you know, people put this just now, clarity, you know, good facilitators are helping make sure that everybody at the meeting knows 
what we're doing here and why that there's just not like there's not that sense of like that can be so disorienting and alienating of like what is happening at this meeting I don't understand what's happening so I can't really participate I feel left out I don't you know I don't know the background of this why are we talking about this any uh, just clarity like where it, where it started where it's going why like that is like vital to facilitation attention to group dynamics I'm noticing that these people aren't speaking, or I'm noticing that these people are speaking a lot. These people seem agitated. There seems to be some subterranean conflict. These people are looking sleepy, like whatever that is, like be able to attend to group dynamics. The facilitator is a cares about the group in that way. Wanting everybody to participate. <laughs> like I am interested in hearing from everybody here. I think someone said in the chat, like, what do you do when people are just kind of going along, right? Like, I think I've mentioned in the last workshop, we're trained in our society to either dominate or go along to get along. Like most of us, it's like, either you're trying to be the boss of the show or you're like trying not to get in trouble and just like get by in like your crappy job or classroom or family or whatever. And so we need people to have a different skill than either of those. We need everybody to be like, I want to say stuff and like care about things and engage. And I want to know what other people are thinking and get, let myself be influenced by others. And I want to influence others. Um, and that, it makes sense that when we show up, we don't, we don't have that skill. We're either trying to dominate or we're trying to go along to get along. So what does it take for a facilitator to say, like to make a situation in which people kind of wake up and participate more and also care about other people's participation and don't dominate. Um, ultimately facilitators are being stewards or co-stewards of the process. Like they're looking out for the process, like, Hey, it, are, you know, are we moving along the agenda we set? Um, are people participating? Like, is this process like dignified and clear and fair? Like just actually caring about that not just about getting my idea through or something. To do this well, we have to prep. <laughs> like, I just can't say this strongly enough. Like the biggest mistake people make when they're the facilitator is just not thinking about the meeting. <laughs> really common, you know? Um, so how do we create a norm in our group that people think about the meeting ahead? Um, one part of that is asking people for agenda items ahead. So that could be on the signal thread or email at the end of the last meeting, being like, hey, what are we, what should we make sure we talk about at the next meeting? Like actually asking that and having people think together, like in one group I'm in, we send out an email saying, what should be on the agenda next time? And it makes people think, oh my gosh, I need everyone's feedback on this. And so then if they were going to forget to make a proposal, they work on the proposal before the next meeting. Like the facilitator is like reminding people to think ahead um, about the agenda. The other pieces, you know, thinking like, what are the goals of this meeting and how can we get there? Like, are we just discussing stuff at this meeting? Do we really need to make a decision about this thing? Cause it's time, um, you know, what is it that we're trying to get through? Um, how can we get everyone participating? And oftentimes like a facilitator will be like, oh, I know we're gonna be talking about this big thing at the next meeting. I'm gonna talk to a few people who I think have strong feelings about it so that I can kind of know what's coming. Like it'll, it'd be better to facilitate in this way or that way because these people are showing up with like something big to say, or um, there's gonna be, you know, a danger that these folks aren't gonna talk. So we gotta make sure we do go rounds or whatever it is that would help us know like, oh yeah, like what would make this um, process really good given what's actually on the agenda. Um, and then making a thoughtful plan. It's really great to have a clear agenda. This is an example that says like the timing of particular topics, what the topic is and who the facilitator is and to go through it at the beginning of the meeting because it might be like, oh y'all, we forgot, we need to talk about this too. Can we find time for that? Like just making sure people have get to consent to what is happening at this meeting and that people, that we actually start and end on time. You know, having a, having a facilitator be the timekeeper or having someone be the timekeeper. We're like, oh, it's 1030. 
it's time to end the report back from the coalition meeting. And if, if it's really essential that it keep going, we have to all consent. Are we all willing to add five minutes to this and take it off the next discussion? Yes. Okay. Then we can go forward. But making sure that people aren't like, oh my God, I've been hijacked. I'm supposed to stay here for three extra hours. I can't do that. The babysitter, you know, whatever. Some other facilitation techniques that are useful. Um, obviously huge keeping stack, which means um, being clear, like who's raised their hand or, or, you know, um, put their name in the chat or however we're doing it so that I know like we're going to hear from Martha and then we're going to hear from Al and you know then we're going to hear from Hope like just like knowing that in some groups people keep progressive stack so they raise people of color to the top or women to the top that can be something facilitators I think you should be explicit if you're doing that and great for if the groups had a conversation about wanting to do that and why so that people get the principle um having timekeeping scribing which means like you know some people will use like a chalkboard or a big paper if they're in person or they might be doing it using like the zoom whiteboard but like when people are talking and you write down what they're saying sometimes they feel heard more or if you write it down wrong they're like oh i'm being misunderstood i actually really mean this it can be a useful tool and then you have these kind of public notes it can also help people follow along who are different kinds of learners Putting people into small groups, like if we're thinking about a big idea together, like let's all go, all go into small groups, or I've been in meetings where we've used like stations, like it'll be like, you know, you, you travel around to different pieces of butcher paper and answer different parts of the question if we're trying to come up with something like group priorities or something, so that you're thinking through these big questions together in small groups. Go rounds. Small groups are great because everyone gets to talk. Go rounds are great because we hear from everybody. So if if there's a, a concern that some people are being silent, like just making sure everybody talks um, or that people can pass, but making sure everybody's really given like a personal opportunity to talk can help us change the, the dynamic if it's just certain people talking. Summarizing, like facilitators being like, wow, we've been having this big conversation. I think this is where we're at. We're trying to decide this. And so far it seems like people have agreed to these parts and this part is still undecided. You know, like, Okay, y'all, like just stewarding this along, moving it along, especially if there's a lot of repetition happening. Polling, sometimes um, a facilitator isn't clear, like, are we getting close to people thinking the same thing on this? And so sometimes um, I'm holding up my thumb, people will do like, you can do a thumbs up, thumb in the middle or thumbs down. It's not a vote. It's a poll to see how are people feeling? You know, are people feeling like um, they're starting to feel like this proposal makes sense. And if you got a lot of thumbs up, um, or if you get some in the middle and some up, you could ask the people who have their thumb in the middle, what's 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 still on your mind, you know? Or if someone's thumb is down, you say, oh, will you bring, what's your concern at this point? Why is this not sounding right to you? So that we can really start to get to the heart of the matter of, you know, are we, can we modify it further? Um, putting stuff in the garden, people bring up topics that are important to the group, but now is not the time to talk about them. Keeping a list of that for future meetings and just knowing when it's like, oh, you know what? It turns out this needs more research or this proposal needs to go back to the drawing board for a new approach. Like we just aren't able to resolve the concerns without some more work. Okay, you know, Hope and Sophie brought this to this meeting. Um, do we have any volunteers to, to come back, to take it and kind of work on the next part and come back with it? Maybe the folks who brought the concerns have, an, have some good ideas. So maybe they want to take it or somebody else. Okay. I want to um, go into this piece around the decision-making chart and then go into um, to our Q and A. Um, this is a, um, oh yeah, someone brought up in the, um, in the chat fish bowls. Um, that can be really useful, like having, um, you know, people who work on this the hardest have a conversation together and everyone else listen and then everyone join or people who have a particular identity in the group that is particularly implicated this decision they just have a conversation and everyone else listens. And then we go back to the whole group. Like, you know, there's lots of ways to work this. Oh, and if, Sophie, if you'll put in the chat right now, there's a bunch of facilitation resources I wanna offer you all. Um, the book on conflict or consensus, which has a PDF online was the first book I ever read on this stuff. It's full of like detailed suggestions. Also, Adrienne Marie Brown has a new book out on facilitation and mediation, which Sophie's putting the link in. 
Um, there is Peter Gelderlos's book on con um, on consensus decision making. I mean, there's tons of stuff, but these are just some some things I want to suggest because I am doing a very cursory um, discussion of facilitation just because of time. Okay, I'm going to try to just get us through the decision making chart piece, and then we'll go into Q and A. This is my book, this idea about decision-making chart if you wanna read it in more detail, but um, decision-making charts are really helpful for groups. It's a chart that helps us know how a decision is initiated. Like how can, if I think something should happen in this group, how should I initiate it? Who needs to be consulted? Who can finalize the decision and who needs to be informed? This is a chart that people in groups make that doesn't have every decision you make. It just has some like key ones and it's always a working draft. People can always propose to change it. It's never gonna have all the decisions, but it can just help ground like how we make decisions here. And so that people don't run off and make them in some other way. And so that new people can enter and understand what's going on. So this is an example of a decision-making chart. It would have, what's the task or function? Who initiates? Who do they consult? Who approves? And who needs to be informed? So I just gave some examples of common decisions that groups make. Like our group needs to make, you know, needs to decide when to take a public position on something. Like we get an email that's like, will you endorse this campaign? Will you endorse this march? Will you sign this public letter? So who initiates? Maybe anyone who receives the request. Somebody sends it to Hope because they know Hope's in the group and they send it to me because they know I'm in the group. And a lot of groups I'm in will have like a rapid response team that deals with things like that, that need to be decided fast. Maybe we only meet once a month or once a week and we can't wait till then. So there'll be like three people who agree to be the rapid response team and that rotates, that duty rotates. And that team is allowed to just make the decision if it's clear. Like, of course, we sign on to anything that opposes criminalizing laws or we sign on to, you know, anything that's for the solidarity budget or anything to defund the police. And so if it's easy and obvious, they just say yes. And, 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 you know, when I receive the email, I know, oh, send it to who's on rapid response now. And if it's not easy and obvious, then they do something like raise it on the listserv or bring it to the next meeting. But that way we can at least take care of the ones that are easy and obvious quickly and have rapid response. Um, and then they need to let everybody know we agreed to this. They put it out. However, we tell everybody things, whether it's our listserv or a signal thread or whatever, so that if I'm in the group, I know, hey, the group I'm in decided this. I don't want to be like, I didn't realize we signed on to that. And now people are asking me about it when they see me at meetings and no one told me that's like a bad feeling. Another example would be, let's say our group does distributions and, and the, you know, the decision is whether or not to take on like a new place where we distribute stuff. Maybe anybody in our group could bring that proposal like, hey, I, I would like us to do this also at the soup kitchen on Thursdays. They would bring that, I'm just guessing in our group, to the distro team and the supplies team, because those are the two teams that are implementing like the main stuff around our distribution. And maybe because it's a pretty big deal to take on a whole new distribution day, that team like works up a proposal in more detail. They add stuff that they know as the supplies team, like where are we going to get the extra food or whatever, or the transportation. And they bring that to the home group at, at, at their, our monthly meeting or whatever we do. And if we decide to go for it and add a day, or maybe we're taking away a day, we tell everybody so that everybody knows, hey, y'all, we're not there on Tuesdays anymore. We're there on Thursdays. It's the kind of thing everybody wants to know. A couple other examples, maybe decisions to apply for funding. Maybe the fundraising team gets to initiate that, or people could tell the fundraising team if they hear about an opportunity. And maybe we have kind of like a sheet, like a lot of groups will have like a sheet, like how do we, when do we say yes or no to funding? Maybe we have a sheet that says we don't take funding from the government or from corporations, we do take funding from blah, 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 like whatever our criteria is, you know? Um, and the fundraising team can finalize it. They use our criteria sheet and they finalize it. And then they let people know maybe at our meeting when they do their little team report. Maybe another one would be, should we join a coalition or not? Maybe anybody in our group could propose it. Um, maybe we, you know, propose it, we like mention it on our signal thread or email. And then everybody has to approve it at the monthly meeting. I mean, obviously the answers to in these cells could be anything. I'm just giving examples. I have one more, but the point of this being what, what I've been talking about the entire time, which is being able to know when something has to go in front of everybody or when it can just go and be implemented by a team. Cause we all have kind of a plan and some shared values around stuff. Like we are trying to get to a place where more stuff can just be implemented by a team or even by a person on that team because we all kind of know the lay of the land. 
because of timing, I think we should go to questions um, because I've really, I went over my hope to, my, my aim to give us 15 minutes for questions, but I wanted to get through the decision-making chart because I think it's a useful tool. So I am gonna look in the private chat where Sophie has, I think been putting questions for me. Okay. Um, how do you address a culture of not speaking up about having objections to consensus or the expectation to go along to get along and being framed as problematic if you have a minority perspective? I think that's a group culture problem in which we might, I might recommend having a group culture conversation about um, conflict avoidance in the group and how to like, how do we all um, like build a skill of wanting to affirm more that it's actually useful when people raise questions about our plans or proposals. Like I would probably bring that up in a group culture conversation or just bring it up in a group meeting and be like, I think we have a group culture concern that I'm noticing. And I wonder if we could make our group culture like more flexible to this. That's probably how I would raise it. But it might be like, we want to have just a general group culture workshop or a workshop on group culture, specifically around conflict avoidance and feedback, which we're going to do a session about in one of these workshops. Um, so that people can kind of like, uh, use my slides if they want to, to like have the same conversation in their group. But that's probably how I would deal with it is like get people to notice it's happening and talk about it together. Um, Oh yeah, this question about whether my membership proposal reproduces a hierarchy. So to me, um, having people take on different amounts of decision-making responsibility isn't necessarily hierarchical. It's like a different kind of labor. It's like, I want to be in the group that is, I want to be part of the group that is um, supporting encampments when they're getting raided, but I actually don't have time to join that group as a steward of all of its work and like be part of the creating work plans. And like, like I, like it's not the main group I'm in, but I want to show up when the, when the raids happen and help pack people up and stand between people and the police or whatever. It's fine to have a whole set of people who choose that role and a set of people who are like, this is my main group in this group. I'm doing work plans and budgets and deed planning. Like that to me isn't a hierarchy. It's just the reality that, all of our groups need like layers of people who will come and do solidarity and have people's backs. And then it also, hopefully we're all going deeper in particular mutual aid groups and taking on more responsibility, right? So, um, or people are like, I have kids, I can't do the extra two meetings a month of that like deeper stewardship at the core of the group, but I wanna be in the group and I'm gonna do this part on this team. And the idea being that everyone is interested in that, that person's opinions and is like wants to pull their wisdom into the group, perhaps by talking to them at a team meeting, like, hey, we're talking about this thing, just curious what you think. But we are, not everybody can be at every meeting or wants to do every kind of labor in a group. So it's less about hierarchy and more about like what kinds of roles people can reasonably take on and knowing who is in what role also in part so that we don't have that thing where it's like, I came once to one of the things and I'm here to block all the decisions, <laughs> you know? Um, so to me, that's like the difference in the amount of responsibility people take on. There are potential power dynamics that happen in it. And we want to have an aim that the people who are stewarding the work very centrally are trying to be very porous and listen in all the other spaces for what people want and need. They're not doing it to dominate, they're doing it to steward. Um, but also just realistically, not everybody has the capacity to take on every role. Um, how do you make a collective development team not become the main ones making decisions? Great. I think that this is about what that stewardship role is. So the collective development team should be creating the container for decision-making should be like, we're going to have a retreat. We've planned where we're going to have it, or we've done the polling to figure out the dates that people can do. We, people seem to really want a disability justice training. We've lined up a trainer. We've created the Google form. So you can tell us what you want to eat at the retreat, you know, like they're doing this care work 
to support the group process, they're not making the decisions for the group, right? Like the work planning or the deciding about whether or not our group wants to take a stand about, about abolition or whatever, like that's happening in group process. So I think that if, a, if, a, if any team is dominating and people are not giving them feedback, um, it's like, we need to name that. That's a moment to discuss group culture. Like, oh, I'm realizing, I think I'm supposed to do whatever that team says or whatever that person says, like talking about that, like talking about how decision-making is going. Um, so I think having that kind of team is ideally about putting more effort towards what's going on inside. Um, a couple other things. Oh yeah, please do, um, Sophie, share the example of a decision-making proposal. I think I didn't mention that one. So yeah, Sophie will put that in the chat. This is just an example of a proposal I wrote for a different group I was in that just kind of named like, yeah, we already mostly use casual consensus where we just kind of like talk about a thing and everybody adds their thoughts. And then we're, when it sounds pretty good, we're all like, okay, let's go. So we just acknowledged that that was how we were naturally making decisions. We acknowledged that we want to bring proposals to the group and that we asked for concerns, like that we acknowledge kind of what consensus is and that we would only use formal consensus when things are really conflictual. Um, and then we talked about the difference between things that were decided on teams. So we didn't have a decision-making chart. We just did this in this proposal, like, hey, these are the kind of things that we all wanna make sure we decide together. And here's some things that teams are empowered to just do in their team. Like the research team gets to decide how to do the research that other teams have asked for. Or, you know, the communications team can finalize graphics and language for posts and stuff. They don't have to bring all of that back to everybody. Um, and then we also noted that using fish bowls or caucuses could help us if we're noticing a power dynamic, like white people are lining up around this or women are lining up around this. Um, and also in that group, we weren't really wanted to make sure to talk about ways to better include people from prisons to call into our meetings or to write, write in or to give them the agenda ahead of time. That was another priority around decision-making. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm just sharing these kinds of documents in case any of it is cut and pasteable in your life. Um, someone also raised this question, what about oppressive standards for what trustworthy looks like? I'm very curious about all the things that might mean to you. One of the things that means to me is sometimes people are blamed for not being trusting, trusting enough when of course they have good reasons for not being trusting enough or not being trusting. So I, I, I see that happening. I think this question about what we think integrity is in our movements, and I think we'll talk about this more when we do the feedback session in these workshops and the kind of discussion about abolition in our groups. Like, how do we become people who do what we say we're gonna do, who acknowledge when we make mistakes, and who tell people when we can't do what we said we're going to do, <laughs> you know, like that to me is a lot about being trustworthy. How do we, this is so much about emotional work in our lives. Like how do I learn more about my impact on others and access more values alignment? Like it makes sense that a lot of us have a hard time. Like I believe in honesty, but I keep finding myself lying or I, believe in listening carefully, but I'm always distracted by what I'm thinking about how to respond. And there's stuff in there from my gender or race training or whatever, you know, like, you know, this is like long-term work, healing work to become trustworthy and to become trusting when it's worthwhile, when it's grounded. Um, I think that if our groups talk about the values and skills of things like giving and receiving feedback, what happens when we procrastinate, how to feel on purpose, how to welcome new people, how to care about group dynamics. Like all of that stuff is about making it possible for people to become more trusting appropriately when it is, and to be more trustworthy. Like, so it's really, it's like a lot. Um, so I think in some ways, all of the pieces of these workshops are about this 
Like if we have transparency in decision-making, the group is more trustworthy. If we have good facilitation, I'm more likely to feel trusting and relaxed when I enter. I'm like, oh, this meeting will start and end when it was said. There will be a break when it was said. People are trying to make sure I participate. People are gonna address it when someone says something harmful. Like all of those things make it possible that I might feel more trusting or that I might act more trustworthy. Like I might show up differently than I would in a space that didn't have those things in place. So it's complicated. I think that all these pieces relate. I realize it's 5.30, it's the end of the workshop. We will post this video and these slides and, um, and have another workshop coming up. I can't remember what date, but it's on the website. Maybe Hope knows. You are muted, Hope. I can't hear you. Right, I have to unmute. Um, <laughs> I was just asking Sophie to drop the date of the next workshop into the chat. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to Dean. Thank you, MJ and Trisha and Lydia, um, and to everyone who was um, chatting and part of the polls. Thanks so much to everyone for being here. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to the next event. Um, Sophie, do you know the date of the next workshop? Okay, hold on one second. I'm just going to look it up. I just want to name that somebody put this great thing in the chat about making sure that um, that making sure that accessibility is part of how we plan things in our facilitation, like making sure people have time to participate in polls or show up to meetings, making sure people are notified ahead of times about things like all, I mean, just in every part of, and having, having a group where people can name access needs consistently. Like in some groups I'm in, we have like a consistent access poll, like a kind of um, Google doc people can fill out about what would make the meetings work better for them. And we have a little fund we keep in case we want to be ready to offer captioning or interpretation or something that we haven't yet, nobody's yet identified. Like just thinking about, or childcare, like just thinking about how to make um, it possible to keep asking people about access needs and to keep resourcing access needs and have like, the, like as the person is asking in the, um, in the chat, like time for that. So thank you for raising that cinnamon love. Okay, um, so the next workshop is Thursday, December 9th. Um, so please um, go back to the um, event page. You can find a link to sign up for that one. And thank you again, Dean, MJ, Trisha, Lydia, Sophie. Thanks everybody. Good night.